When you're learning German, of course you need to learn some basic nouns like man, woman, child. And at first you think, well, that can't be so bad, right? Wrong. Because then, before you know it, you realize that although the word for man is man, that's simple enough, if you want to say something even as basic as the man, you have to choose between der Mann, den Mann, dem Mann, des Mannes, and then you get into the plural men, and you have die Männer, unless it's der Männer, or worse yet, den Männern. What is going on with this? This is confusing. Seven different versions of the noun man in German. Then add to that, if you want to learn woman, five different versions of that. Child, six different versions. Why are German nouns so hard? Rather than to tell you, well, you're just going to have to memorize these five to seven different versions of every German noun, there are only thousands of them you'll need to know, in this video, we are going to look at some shortcuts for understanding what these changes are, why they're happening in German, and how you can do them yourself. Tips coming up in this video you won't hear anywhere else, starting with my three-step formula for understanding German nouns. Before we can break down the why is behind what is happening with German nouns, first let's understand the what. What exactly is changing here? If we look at our example with man, okay? Firstly, we can see that the noun itself may change, right? We might go from man to maness, or in the plural to go from the mene to adding an n onto the end. But most of the time, the changes that are happening are happening to the words in front of man, right? With the dea and the dane and the dame, etc. Okay, now check this out. This full table here, this is the full shebang. You need this. We're going to break this down in this video, but we're going to start by looking at this column right here. So what I want you to notice is how in this table, we have the R that's lining up with the R in der Mann. We have an N lining up with den Mann an M lining up with dem man, and then an S lining up with des manes. These single letter uh, changes here to the ends of how we're saying the in each of these versions of man, these little changes are called declensions. What are declensions? All right, now we're gonna look at this sentence to start answering that question. We're going to return to this same sentence throughout this video, always layering our understanding of what is happening here. So what I want you to notice is that we have the clensions happening on the ends, the tail ends, of the words that come right in front of our nouns, which note in German are always capitalized, even in the middle of a sentence. All nouns, not just proper nouns, common nouns too, right? We just have a cake, right, that's capitalized. All nouns are capitalized, that will come in handy. It's nice to be able to find them easily. And we have these tiny single letter uh, endings, again, called the clensions, that are happening on the words coming in front of those nouns. So we have a total of six different declension options. M, N, R, S, E, and then a no declension whatsoever, all right? So now notice that in our all-in-one declension table, we have those six options that occur throughout in different combinations, right? But you can see R's and N's and S's and E's, right, all over the place in this table. So on a basic level, we can say that all of those different variants, right, the five to seven different versions of every noun in German, those are a matter of these declensions, these six different declension options. So if that's what is happening, we need to dive into why that is happening because you need to know how to use this table. 
the very first step in using that all-in-one declensions table is that we have to start with noun gender. Now, all nouns in German have gender. In this sentence, the nouns that we are working with are all masculine nouns. Papa is a masculine noun. Zone is a masculine noun. That makes sense, right? That seems fairly intuitive. But cake mm, is also a masculine noun. Okay, now that feels a little weird to us as English speakers. In German, we actually have four different noun gender options. Typically, students are told it's three, but functionally, the plural is also a gender. So we have masculine nouns such as man. We have feminine nouns such as Frau, meaning woman. We have neuter nouns such as Kind, meaning child. So man, Frau being masculine, feminine. Again, this feels fairly intuitive. Kind, you know, we can at least get behind it with a little additional thought, you know, that a child not yet full grown into either a man or a woman, so it's neuter. Okay, I'm with you. And then the plural gender is simply any of these three genders in the plural form, right? If we're saying men or women or children, then they would all be in the plural form. Okay, great. So now this is where it starts to get a little weird for us again, because in German and all nouns have gender, not just not just people, but everything. So concrete nouns such as butterfly and apartment and paper, right? Things that you can see, touch, taste, smell, etc. And also abstract nouns, evening, friendship, experiment. All of these nouns in German have gender. They're either masculine, feminine, neuter, or we could put them in their plural forms. And it's tempting, it would seem attractive to think that there's some quality of these nouns that makes them either masculine or feminine or neuter, but that's not how it works. How it works is actually much better than that because it becomes objective instead of subjective, but it's actually about how nouns, it's not always this way, but frequently, frequently about how nouns are spelled in German of all of the things. Okay, so we have particular endings on nouns in German that are associated with one of the genders over the other. So for example, this ling on Schmetterling for butterfly, that is a masculine ending. So we know that it's der Schmetterling if we wanted to say the butterfly. The ung, ung, is a feminine ending, so it's going to be die Wohnung. The ier, this is a neuter ending, and so it would be das Papier. And again, with because of the endings, we could know what gender these nouns are just based on their spelling alone. There are other tips and tricks that go into learning German noun gender as efficiently and effectively as possible that you don't hear about in a lot of places. I cover all of this in depth in my paid online courses, but for right now, it suffices for our purposes that if you want to practice the information that you'll learn in this video, if you start with the noun gender, you can simply look a noun up to see is it der, die, or das? Is it a masculine, feminine, or neuter noun? And you can go and then you can work with it from there, okay? And learn those shortcuts for noun gender specifically a little bit later. So if that's the first step in our how-to formula, now the second step is going to tell us what we're supposed to do with all of this stuff, okay? We just took care of the gender going across the top here, right, There's those are our four genders right there, but now they're going to intersect with whatever is happening over here. And what is happening is something called noun case. This is a doozy of a topic, but we're gonna break it down so you can start understanding this. We're gonna look at some English examples to start bringing this home. So nouns. In English, we have essentially two types of nouns. We have subject nouns, the cat, that man, this flower, they are all taking an action of some kind. The cat is drinking, the man sees, the flower has, and the object nouns are what 
is being drunk? What is being seen? What is being had? Okay, so we have subject nouns that we could say in English are in the subjective case. We have object nouns that we could say are in the objective case. And for the most part in English, that's all we're working with. Subject nouns in the subjective case, object nouns in the objective case. Okay, now if we look at our same sentence, it's a little shorter now, we left out the sun, right, the small sun, but we have der liebe Papa lining up with the caring dad, right, that is the subject in this sentence, right, and what is that dad doing? He is baking. What is he baking? He's baking a yummy cake. That's the object noun in this sentence. German and English just is working the same way. German also has the subjective case for subject nouns, although it's better called the nominative case, okay? And then the accusative and the dative cases in German are basically the concept of the objective case in English, but divided into two different options, okay? So German is now getting more complicated than English, surprise, surprise. And then on top of that, we have a fourth and final case in German called the genitive case. Not gonna talk about that in this video. You can really save that for down the road in your German learning anyway, but um, it would be the idea of relating two nouns to each other in a possessive sense, like the father of the bride or my husband's best friend, right? Two nouns that connect to each other like that. So these German noun cases, and uh, they change. Okay, so if we look back at all of these different versions of man and woman and child, right, so many different versions, the one element that is impacting them is the gender of the noun, whether it's masculine or it's feminine or it's neuter, and that gender, right, is a static, unchanging feature of the noun. The noun's case, on the other hand, changes from sentence to sentence because the case of the noun is about the role that it's playing in the sentence, okay? So if we have a subject noun, right, the role that it's playing is it's taking action in the sentence, it has to be put into the nominative case, right? So that would be like the cat or that man or this flower. The direct object in a sentence that is receiving that action, right, that the uh, the milk is being drunk, the dog is being seen, etc., that in German is going to go into the accusative case specifically, right? It's no longer just the objective case. It's going to be either the accusative case or the dative case. So there's a distinction being made in German that we don't typically make in English. If we have an indirect object in German, which is going to be when something, when an action taken is for a particular recipient or a beneficiary, then that noun has to be put into the dative case. And then finally, we have that genitive case, which again, we're not going to talk about more right now. But with just this information, I want you to now see in our sentence that we're working with here that we go from the caring papa, der liebe papa, as the subject of the sentence, taking the action of baking to then directly connecting, if you will, to what is being baked, right? The yummy cake or a yummy cake. And indirectly, that action is being taken for the small son, right? His little son. So there we have the subject noun in the nominative case right? Then this indirect object would be in the dative case, and this direct object would be in the accusative case. So now with these first two elements of our formula, knowing the nouns static, unchanging gender, masculine, feminine, neuter, plural, and then knowing the noun's case, the role that it's playing in the given sentence, which changes, right? It's either nominative, accusative, dative, or genitive. Once you have those two elements of information, you can get yourself to the correct 
intersection of the all-in-one declension table. So the gender, right, going across the top, the case going across the bottom, so that you might be in the masculine dative or the neuter nominative or the feminine uh, dative, the plural accusative, whatever. You're, you're here now, and sometimes we have duplicate declensions, right? They're, they're the same, right? We have some double E's, some double N's, but all the rest of the time, we have two or even three different options for declensions that somehow we have to know how to choose from them. Whoa. So if at this point, your eyes are starting to glaze over and you're thinking, this is so complicated. I'm just, I'm just gonna stop learning German right now. Hold on, hold on, you can do this, but I need you to understand the importance of working with this declension table as the only table that you need for making all of these different changes, right? Those five to seven variants of every German noun. See, normally, conventionally, you work with multiple tables, even more than this, to uh, to learn these declensions where everything is getting spelled out for you, right? The day, the day, and the day, and the desk, right? Or maybe you're learning a uh, instead and it gets all spelled out for you or whatever. The beauty of the all-in-one declension table is that it's all that you need. You will work with this, you know, just apply this, practice with this. You'll have it internalized before you know it. And then you're not forced to work with with, you know, like 10, 12 different tables, you're empowered to make these declension changes yourself because you actually understand the why behind it, right? So that first why is the gender, the second why is the case, right? Now we need um, a third step to all of this, right? We can see the declension combo of the R and the E and the M and the N. And now here we have a double N, right? So we can see those combinations at work. This is just for right masculine nouns in this example. But we need to know which of those declensions in the given combos at any of those 16 intersections of the table, which ones do we use? When, how, how does this work? The third and final step in our process is to work with what I call declension patterns. So this is covered again in depth in my paid online courses, but for right now, we're going to focus on uh, the very first, the standard declension pattern. Before we can uh, fully explain that, we have to back up just a little bit to talk about what types of words in German need declensions in the first place, okay? Up until this point, I've just said the words coming in front of nouns, right? Sometimes the nouns themselves, but the words coming in front of nouns. We need to get more specific than that. We need to know that it is specifically determiners, adjectives, and nouns that in German will take these six different declensions, right? The, the M, the N, the R, the S, the E, or the no declension, okay? So nouns, we're not gonna talk about that more right now. Adjectives, this is probably a familiar term, right? Adjectives describe nouns in some way. You know, the, the ball is big, red, shiny, smooth, fast, whatever, right? We describe nouns with adjectives. Determiners, more likely a new word for you. Determiners are any word that tell us which one or how many of the noun. So that's saying the, a, uh, this, that, some, many, few, all, one, two, three, ten, etc. Those are determiners, right? Because we're saying which one, you know, his, my, your, those are all determiners. Which one or how many of the noun? So if we look at our familiar sentence here, we can see, we'll look at this in English and German both, we have the is a determiner telling us which dad we're talking about his determiner. What son are we talking about? A, uh, also a determiner. How many cakes? It's a cake, not 20 cakes. Caring, this is an adjective. Little adjective, yummy adjective. It's describing the noun in some way. It's exactly the same thing in German, okay? 
determiners, and adjectives coming in front of the nouns, and those determiners and adjectives are where we see our declensions, R, E, M, N, and the double N. So the standard declension pattern, right, the only one we're going to focus on now, there are three more, right, this is so interesting, there are uh, four genders, four cases, four declension patterns, but we're going to focus just on the first declension pattern, the standard declension pattern, tells us that the determiner, the his, her, uh, the, some, many, few, etc. the determiner is going to take what is called the strong declension. Notice that that flag symbol is in our chart, right? We're looking at the snippet again for masculine nouns. This is called the strong declension. And the, that R then is going to go onto the determiner, okay? Then if we have any adjectives, right? Because they're optional. That's what that asterisk is about. If we have any adjectives, they are going to take the weak declension. Notice that lining up again, right? So it's a different set of declensions. Here again happens to match, but most of the time they're different. So if we look at this uh, section for section with our sentence, if we start with the most basic sentence possible of a subject noun and then a verb, right? The action that's being taken, the caring papa bakes, we can see that our determiner has the strong R declension from the nominative case because this is the subject noun, okay? And then we can see that adjective is taking the weak E declension from the masculine nominative, right? Should have included that on the side. So that's the nominative, accusative, dative, and genitive. Great. So now if we expand the sentence, right, we add in that yummy cake, right, we still have the subject noun is der liebe Papa, and we can see that it's the subject noun precisely because of the declension combo that's being used, that R and the E, according to our standard declension pattern here. And now for our cake, which is the direct object, which always goes into the accusative case, we can see that double N, right? Both the determiner a uh, and the adjective yummy are taking the N declension. So now full sentence, we've added in the indirect object, his little son, and we see that because the determiner his has the strong M declension coming from the dative case and the weak N declension coming from the dative case. So now on a meta level, you understand that those five to seven different versions of every German noun are a matter of these three elements of noun gender, right? Static, unchanging, noun case, always changing, and declension pattern. These three elements interact to give us those specific declension combinations on the determiners and the adjectives coming in front of nouns. Whew, awesome. There's so much more to learn about gender and case and declension patterns. I get into all of those details in my paid online courses, but if you would like to get some free hands-on practice with noun case specifically, where you're practicing identifying what role is this noun playing and therefore what case does it need to be put into in German, if you want to practice that, then I encourage you to visit my website germanwithlaura.com or click the link below to sign up for my free mini course that discusses noun case a little bit more in depth than in this video. Of course, you can keep learning with me here on YouTube as well by clicking on the next video. See you there.